My name is Ryan Susi, and I'm the clinical educator with UConn EMS. So what I'm talking about today is spinal motion restriction. This is something that uh, in the last couple of years has come under a lot of scrutiny, a lot of research, a lot of evidence out there to show that maybe it's not the best thing that we actually do. So we're going to look a bit at the past, where it came from. We're going to look a little bit what we're doing currently in the present, and we're going to look at where we're going in the future. Now the thing with spinal motion restriction is because it's been around for so long, to actually change something like this that is standard of care that we see as, it's very, very difficult. So it's just not today me saying, when we're done, you guys can follow what the recommendations are in here. You still have to follow your guidelines, you still have to follow your protocols. Um, because it's not just EMS, there's the hospital corp, there's community nursing, there's other stakeholders involved in this transitional period and phase. So let's look, kind of look where it's come from. So does anyone know when spinal motion restriction kind of came into favor in pre-hospital care? 1932. Well, 32, no, not quite, but close, not too far off. So when we look at the history of it, it was actually around 1955 when the concept of it was proposed. And did anyone have any idea who proposed the concept? Like if it was Canada, Europe, the States, Australia? Canada. It actually came out of Toronto, the original proposal for it. So I'm going to go just up here. So in 1955, a couple of physicians in Toronto made this big kind of clinical decision that if we spinal immobilize people, we'd actually prevent injuries of the spine. But I'm going to go back here. So when we look at a lot of things that we do in EMS, we've accepted what has happened in the hospital as practice that would work in the pre-hospital environment, or we've gone off of expert opinion. And this is where spinal motion came from. It was expert opinion saying, you know what, if I treat it like a long bone fracture, so I splint above and below like we do, and I do that for the spine, that makes sense to us. And that's how it kind of came out. But there was no actual evidence or scientific research to support this. So initially, this study comes out in 1955 by these doctors in Toronto. And around 1966, a couple orthopedic surgeons in the state started to accept it. And then around 66, 67, when the first EMS ambulance came out in Miami, it became standard of practice. And then we were, I don't want to say stuck with it, but that's what it started with. And when we look at, if we keep going back and we go here, the initial idea behind the backboard was not to keep the person on the backboard. It was to decrease movement during extrication from cars. And that was it, because in 1965, the U.S. government commissioned what's called the White Paper. And the White Paper is why we are all here today. Canada did something very similar around 66, and basically it said we need to improve care that is delivered to people who get into car accidents on highways. And that's where all of EMS kind of came from, was this White Paper concept in the States. So... You look right up here, sagging during extrication. That was the whole goal of it, to prevent the body from moving during extrication. But from that, we then went, huh, well, if we're using it for MVCs, it's got to work for falls. It's got to work for gunshot wounds. And then we went, well, let's look at every other mechanism of injury that could cause spinal, spinal fractures and spinal and spinal motion. So we then added it to everything. That we, you know, how many rules are there out there in school that we teach get, you know, if you fall from greater than three feet, if you have an axial load, if you have a gunshot wound to the chest, all these things started to come in and we looked at mechanism of injury. But we never actually researched it. We went and said, okay, this makes sense. So, stabilization rates continued to rise. And more and more people were putting on to these boards. Around 1999, 2000, the Alberta College of Paramedics did a little study. They wanted to see how fast people's skin degraded on backboards. That was kind of the, the stepping stone of the removal of backboards. And they found it takes about 30 minutes for people who are healthy to have skin degradation on backboards. They didn't look at anything else. They just wanted to see how uncomfortable people were sitting in offload delay for a couple hours were. And... Then they went and they went to unhealthy people with other comorbidities and they found, you know what, it's actually about 15 minutes. So for any of us in this room, it's probably 30. But for some of our patients that are older, that have different spinal issues, that have different skin issues, we're actually up to about 15 minutes that we start to cause the degradation. 
Now, I've highlighted this. No study has demonstrated that penetrating trauma can cause spinal injury. So we want to make sure that with penetrating trauma, where do they need to be first? What's the best place that these people need to be that have penetrating trauma? The back of our ambulances, the eMERGE, or the surgical suite? Surgical suite, right? So they looked at a bunch of different data networks in the States, and they found that we were delaying care to surgical suites, which is the definite treatment that these people need to make sure that we properly spinal mobilize these patients. And so that was kind of the real big one that came out that looked at, I think it was about 65,000 cases. So it was a huge national study out of the States. So these guys are called the Eagles. And I know that's kind of funny. It's not a band or anything. It's actually a group of the biggest medical directors in the States that oversee New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia. And they got together and they looked and they said, we're not actually going to study this because how would we ever get this through an ethics board? So we're going to study the bad outcomes that come from spinal mobilization instead of reinventing the wheel. And they're trying to prove that it doesn't work. So their big kind of final paper is we don't need to actually apply full spinal mobilization. Backboard should be used solely for extrication. So this is a massive study that or a massive um, statement that they put out. And it affected all of the United States. And it's trickled over into Canada as well. So I'm going to throw some numbers up here. Out of 5,400 patients that were spinal immobilized in a field due to some sort of mechanism injury or back injury between 2010 and 2013, 233 had some sort of a spinal fracture, a dislocation, or subluxation. So it's a really small amount. We're looking at 4.3%. And only 29 had an unstable injury. Now I'm going to give you a little antidote. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to talk about stories or war stories or anything like this. So many years ago when I was in ALS school, I was a ski patroller. And I've seen many people come down doing backflips off, off these tabletops and jumps, and they get up and they walk away. This one guy, he was probably a little too old to be actually doing the jump, but, you know, he wanted to pretend he was still young. And he came down, and he actually showed up in our first aid room. And we talked to him, and he was moving his neck, and he was doing this. And this is back in the day, well, frick, the mechanism of injury clearly dictated that we needed to do this. So we put him on a board. We put him on a collar and drove, wait for the ambulance, which was an hour to get there, because this is down in southern Alberta, hour to get back into town. They x-rayed. They CT'd him. Nothing wrong. So he walked into my first aid room doing this. I can remember the day where I would say, sir, don't move, and I would tackle people to put them on the board, right? Or we'd learn these standing takedowns. And what was really neat is we've researched the motion now that those things actually do. By me coming and standing takedown someone or strapping someone to a board, the person may be not moving, but physically they're moving inside. Their muscles are contracting. They're actually fighting against a strap. And we have research now to show that that's actually causing more damage than good. So, you know, I, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've put many people on backboards. I used to have races to see how quick I could do it. I'm sure we've all done this in school where we flip the guy upside over that's on the backboard or hang him upside down, right? That's, just, that's what we do in school, but it's not far from the truth of what we did. You know, 951 people suffered falls that were on backboards, and nothing was wrong with them. So the day of the backboard and spinal mobilization is slowly coming to an end. So 2000, the Alberta College of Paramedics did that study. Around 2006, the Canadian C-spine study came national. Same time, the uh, Nexus study in the States kind of came out nationally. And where the Nexus study looked at is they looked at two hospitals, a similar um, training, similar level of care, in two cities that were very comparable. One was in the United States, one was in Kuala I cannot say that word, Kuala Lumpur. And what they found was, hold on, if I do this right, no, hold on. What they found was, oh, Doug, it's not working. Anyway, what they found was is they had a better, they had people in Kuala Lumpur do better than the people in Albuquerque for not having neurological deficits because they were not put on spine boards for a period of a long time. There's supposed to be like some animation that comes up, but it's okay. And now I'm, one second. 
I'm a Mac user, so I got some. There we go. Ah, there it comes. Comes up anyway. So there was less neurological disability in the patients that were not spinally mobilized. So, what do you guys think is the best way to spinal mobilize a patient? If we're not using, I'll give you a hint. It's not that big thing in the back. Position of comfort. Do you think we still need collars? Yeah, we're still going to use collars. Uh, when I worked in BC and I started there, we used sandbags. And they're actually saying, you know what, if you have someone on a stretcher and you just put a sandbag next to their head and you put a blanket, the old blanket uh, horseshoe around it, that's probably good enough as well. Because people are going to put themselves where they feel most comfortable to sustain if they have a fracture. If the damage is already done, if you get there and they are already paralyzed, the stuff that we do to prevent further injury isn't going to actually make the injury any better or worse because they are actually already paralyzed at this point. If they have an unstable fracture, they're going to put themselves how they feel comfortable. You know when we teach first aid and you break your collarbone, you're supposed to throw your arm up like this, right? Now, if, when I pick up patients that have fractured collarbones, I let them put it wherever it's comfortable. If I tell them to crank it up here and they want it down here, you know, and that's what the body does. The body is going to actually place itself in what is the best position possible. It's going to splint itself. There's a ton of muscles and stuff around your back, and it's going to hold it together. So the hint is the day of the spider straps. If those were something that were super fun to use, are gone, the backboard's gone, the scoop. When do we use a KED? Okay, that is not a manufacturer recommendation for a KED. That is an EMS recommendation that has not Yukon EMS, but what we have done in EMS. KEDs were for very stable patients that we thought had a suspected spinal injury. So the day of the KEDs even gone. My baby look hot tonight. Anybody remember that from uh, how to do your straps? That, those, those mnemonics are going to be gone, all right? So you come up on scene, and uh, you're at a car accident. Person's trapped in the car, can't get out because the door's pinned or whatever. Fire has now come and take the car, the door off, or the, be able to and allow the person to extricate. The goal of extricating people out of vehicles is having them extricate themselves now. It's not about getting in behind, holding the neck, sliding the backboard under around, twisting them, sliding them out upside down, and all the other stuff that we used to do. If they can get themselves out of the car, they're good, right? So this is actually seven steps, which is basically can be done, sir, hold on, we'll get the door out of the way for you, we'll take your seatbelt off, and can you actually slowly get yourself out? And if there is no, well, my legs are numb and I can't move them, then we're going to help them. But if they can assist themselves out of the car, they're fine. Give you another story. Um, this goes back to Ottawa when I worked there. Showed up, person's walking around outside, no injuries whatsoever. Most amazing car accident I've ever seen. Like, there was nothing left. No one was dead. It was good because the new cars are built really, really well. Get to the hospital and give a report. Well, why are they not on a backboard? He was walking. They put him on a backboard, sat in offload delay with me for a couple hours, spinal mobilized, because that's what the pro, I, I was kind of breaking protocol at that point to find out two hours later there was no spinal fracture. If someone is walking around outside, we don't tackle them anymore and put them on a backboard, right? We don't do the standing takedown. It's a theme I keep saying because that actually injures us. I've seen more responders get back injuries from trying to do a standing takedown properly on, and I'm not that big of a guy, I'm only 200 pounds, but you can see, you know, some six foot four guy and you're about five foot two, it's next to impossible to do it safely. So if they're out walking, their C-spine is fine. This is a kind of a neat thing. Conventional techniques that we currently use today record up to four times more cervical spine movement than if they just got out of the car themselves. So we've all practiced being the patient, right? How much have we moved while our colleagues are assisting us in getting out of that car? We move more. We, the 1955 recommendations by those physicians in Canada, it was about to assist getting out of the car, not to maintain on that backboard. And we cause more movement than what we're hoping to prevent. 
by preventing less movement by allowing them to get out of the car themselves. So rule number one in medicine, do no harm. Some complications of backboards. Who's been on a backboard a long period of time down a bumpy road? Not for fun, like, you know, because you want to, but because of the fact that, you know, you've had to be there. So respiratory compromise. I can tell you, those people that are fighting me because they might be a little intoxicated, I pull the straps a little tighter, right? And that way, they, it's harder for them to breathe. But I didn't realize that when I was new in my career. Because, sir, you can't move. If you move, you could be paralyzed. And that, I've told that to thousands of patients. And so we just crank on the straps a little bit more. But we inhibit their chest from expanding. It's not comfortable. Pressure sores. Alberta demonstrated this back in the 2000s. 30 minutes for any of us in the room, 15 for someone who's got some skin problems or bone problems. Increased pain. When I first started with BC Ambulances in OFA Level 3, we used to blanket and there would be blankets everywhere and we tried to pad it as much as we could. Then we went to the vacuum mattresses. They're still painful. You're restricting motion. Human beings hate being completely not able to move. And nine times out of 10, there's increased imaging at the eMERGE, right? And increased imaging at the eMERGE means more doses of x-rays, whether it's CT or x-ray, you know, and there's complications that come with that as well. We talked about the intoxicated thing. That is not me, but I have been in that position before in school, and it is, you know, making sure that all of your straps are tight and you haven't moved that much. So, Alberta Health Services. One of the biggest EMS systems in the country, and Ontario, Ontario Ministry of Health, this is what they've done. We want to make sure that we're not looking at the mechanism of injury anymore. We want to assess the patient. So the car could be completely destroyed, but if the patient's out walking around, probably no injury. Assess your patient. So it is imperative that practitioners primarily assess the patient and not the scene for mechanism of injury. Of note, long boards can still be used to facilitate extrication, but once you get them out, take them off. My favorite new tool is going to be the scoop because it's much easier to take a person off the scoop once you get them onto the stretcher than actually physically rolling them again on the long board. So, SMR and C collar application are contraindicated in penetrating isolating trauma. This is not our current guideline. This is what I'm hoping we are going to. This is Alberta Health Services. The long board is only necessary for extrication. So this is a province-wide protocol in Alberta. EMR, PCP, ACP, CCP. Same with Ontario. So they've gone one step ahead and they've actually put it on paper. We're getting there and we're going to get there. I can't tell you when. I can tell you it's going to be sometime in the next year or so but we have other stakeholders that we have to work with to get that, this done. So the guideline hasn't changed. All of these things still have to require spinal motion restriction, but we're eliminating the backboard and we're just putting on the collar. Longboard should only be used for extrication or as a means of moving an immobile patient to the stretcher. EMS practitioners may remove the patient from long boards and place them supine with C collars and head rolls. Fairly straightforward. That's why I like the scoop, right? You scoop them up, pick them up, put them down, take the scoop off, and they sit comfortable. What do you think we have challenges to rolling this out? And I tried to find a really old crusty paramedic to put up there too. So it's just not nurses, doctors, it's us as well. It's first aid attendants, it's uh, lifeguards, Canadian Ski Patrol. This is huge. This is big. This isn't just, I say today we start this. It's, there's many stakeholders and many other things that we have to take into consideration than just us. Because we, we if we don't do this and we show up at the hospital or the health centre or we respond with our community nurse, may not know what this new guideline is. So there's lots of education coming, just not to you guys. But for now, we're going to continue what we've always done and follow our guidelines and our practice. So, any questions? Comments, <laughs> concerns, rude remarks? Anyone think? Yes? <coughs> Which one? Yeah. Okay. 
So basically, follow your current. So right now, you're going to still spinal mobilize people. And if the nurse tells you to spinal mobilize, you're going to spinal mobilize. When we have worked with Community Nursing Hospital Corp, then we will start rolling this out. Basically, we are still working under mechanism of injury, right? But as we roll forward, if the patient has any of these indications, they only get a collar. There's no more backboards. Can you go down? Oh, yeah, you can't see them? Uh, fall from one meter or five stairs. I think this is probably fairly standard. An axial load injury, so that's the guy holding a big box and it comes down and squishes his head in turtle-like syndrome. MVC greater than 100 kilometers an hour or injected. Bicycle accident, MVC with death of an occupant. Altered LOC, GCS of 14 or less. Disorientated to person or place. If you ask me what the date is right now, I'm, I fail that one all the time. Um, if they have any unequal grip strength, paresthesia, alcohol or drugs, or uh, distracting painful injuries. As we move forward, these aren't going to change for putting a collar on someone, right? But they're going to sit on the bed and they're going to be comfortable on the bed. And we're going to make them as comfortable as possible. There will be education and training that will come out when this comes out. So I just want you to keep it in the back of your heads that this is coming. This is not it's starting today. You can't go tomorrow if you respond on a call and say, oh, I just watched this thing Ryan Susie did. You have to actually still follow your guidelines. So I wanted to bring some education and some stuff of what is the trend and what is the future and where we are going and what the rest of North America is doing. So, yes. You can sit them up. Well, I wouldn't put them full Fowlers, but there is, I, I cut the Alberta one really, really short to the key points. Uh, the Alberta one actually recommends that if you have a head injured patient, that they actually do sit up at 30 degrees with the collar on. So those are all recommendations that will come out when the training does come and when the guideline does come. This is solely about understanding that there ever was any research to support spinal mobilization. No one actually did a randomized controlled study. It was expert opinion. So. All right, well, oh, yes. So it's quite interesting when you talk about pediatrics. So uh, when we look at the Nexus guideline, which is in the States, the Nexus guideline includes pediatrics because they got it through their ethics boards. When you look at the Canadian C-spine rule, they couldn't get it through the ethics board, so they use 16. The same rule, the, those rules are, even though they're new rules, they're going to be old, outdated rules very soon. Um, pediatrics, it is very, very hard to break uh, the spinal fracture or cause a spinal injury in a pediatric because they are so pliable. Um, I've watched many kids in my day as ski patrol triple backflips or whatever and land straight on their head and have the axial load injury. They shake it off and they ski away and they do it again kind of idea. So um, it would apply the, this, when we, when we roll out this guideline, it'll apply all the, the whole age spectrum. So like I said, but for today, moving forward, we still follow our current standard of care. So all right. Yes. Yeah, if they're already paralyzed when you get there, there's absolutely nothing that putting them on a backboard will do to make the paralyzation worse. If you get there and you have numbness and tingling in one arm or that sort of idea, once again, we cause more damage from people fighting the backboard. Now, they may be compliant, but when you're sitting on a backboard for a long period of time, you try to move, right? And that movement is what is shown is causing more damage. We can generate an exuberant amount of force with our muscles and um, that's what's as they're trying they're, they're being compliant but they're still moving and that force is what's causing the damage it's not the actual putting them on the backboard or the uh, collar it's them fighting against the restraining straps you know what if the, the helmet same we're, we're still going to take helmets off the same way that we do and same way that we're taught but it's yes do helmets increase the risk of neck injury probably in that sort of situation but it's not it doesn't change the angle care which is the just a collar on them so all right well if that's it thank you i hope that was